Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Ahmed Yurima's play Heart of Stone. Um, now I've done videos on a few other plays by Yurima before, and I think he's really fantastic. And one of the things he's consistently pretty interested in across the plays that I've read by him are these questions about fate and free will. Like, are we are we predestined to carry out particular fated, often tragic um, actions, or do we have free will? Are we are we free to do as we please? And Heart of Stone, I think, is in that same vein. It's raising those same concerns. It's also kind of a play of two halves. Um, as the play opens with uh, a woman uh, named Patu uh, who goes to the, the leader, the elder of, of her family, a chief, and she starts by sort of telling him about this recurring dream she's had where her daughter, who died in childbirth, is weeping and um, holding a burial shroud, basically. A chief is essentially like, I don't care, this is nonsense. There's, there's no meaning, no portent to these dreams. But then he kind of switches gears and a, a little while later, um, when Patu's grandson Musa comes back, um, and so and that's actually the other thing that Patu tells him is that her her grandson Musa, who's sort of um, been given this important ceremonial role as an elder, even though he's a, he was a baby at the time, um, <clears throat> that he's been missing for six weeks, and uh, a chief is like. Why didn't you come tell me about this sooner? And she was like, well, I had stuff on my mind, basically. So that that's the opening bit. Now, what's interesting is Musa comes back and he goes to see a chief. And a chief tells him about his father, a chief's father. That was not Musa's. He says five days before he died, er, he tell, and a chief tells him that um, basically his father had the, the gift of prophecy. He says, five days before he died, he woke up, packed all his personal property in his room into two big bundles, just before the first cock crowed. Then he got all the women in the household to bring their children to his room, where he taught them a song. He now invited your grandfather and I to his room, and where, where we met you sitting on his lap, his royal red dadu's cap on your little head. He made us promise to get the children to sing that song as we take him to, into the big bush for his burial on a rainy day in five days' time. He also requested that two gunshots be fired, each by us, before we would take him into the big bush. Um, and basically that comes true. Like, he dies five days later, he's to be, he's going to be buried. Um, it's raining. But a chief and his brother forget to get the children um, to sing the song, and they forget to fire the two gunshots. And so the men who are carrying the body like turn around as though compelled by some force he says um da, da, da. he says as we carried him to the entrance of the big bush the necks of the three men who carried his body turned and without a word they returned home propelled by a spirit we could not see and so because they've forgotten to do these things that their father asked um, the the penalty that he prophesies comes true because the father had said um, that failure to carry out his wishes would lead to the death of his first son immediately after his death and I would lead a wasted life losing the title of Dada to you that's to Musa so because they've forgotten these things this fate comes true and um, a chief tells uh, Musa that he, it, Musa, is fated as well. 
He says, my, grand, my father, your great-grandfather, had said that she would not live long, and if care was not taken, you would die a very violent death. Abukele and I made sacrifices, but I wonder now if our ancestors can change it now. He kept seeing you in the, a pool of blood, your limbs torn apart, your heart spitting bloody pellets of stone, and I've not slept a wink since then, son. So we've got that element. Um, we've got that element of it. And it's an interesting thing that a chief puts so much stock in his father's prophecies. But then the basically the first thing that we see him do in the play is dismiss Patu's dream. And again, dreams in folklore are very often seen as prophetic. And Patu's dream of her daughter crying with the tears wetting her burial shroud, and then later in the play, her dream where she's holding another burial shroud. Um, and, and Patu thinks that that shroud is for her, but it's actually for Musa. Um, and she actually tells Musa that at one point because he's saying prayers for the dead. Um, and she like confronts him about saying these prayers for the dead um, as though he is going to die. Um, and she says, you, uh, da, 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 da. I've prayed for her soul since then. Uh, she died the day you were born, Musa. This is about his mom. And I've prayed for her soul since then, Musa. We have watched with fear in our hearts. Musa says, we. Patu says, yes, we. Musa says, I shall kill Amina when I see her. That's his um, fiance, basically. Patu says, not Amina, your mother and I. She woke me up, the same dream, crying, her shroud wrapped around her. Only this time she held another one. At first I thought it was for me, so I stretched out my hand to collect it, but she shook her head as another hand came from behind me to collect it. When I turned my face, it was yours, I saw, Musa, yours. We were both uh, we both started to cry in the dream, and she begged me to hurry to you. But here you are, Musa, a living corpse. Why? So we've got all these prophetic elements. And one of the things that strikes me is that they, they stand in different sort of relationships as truth. Um, so a chief believes in his father's prophecies, and indeed they come true, but he outright rejects Patu's dreams um, and their, their portents of disaster, even though, as we'll see, those dreams come true as well. So we've got that, and that's sort of, that's sort of what occupies a lot of the first half of the play, is the, these sort of discourses about prophecy about dreams and about um fate essentially but then in the second half of the play things shift or really the the last third of the play things shift dramatically because we find out that so M musa claims that he had gone um to work he'd gone and gotten a job and that's why he's gone for six weeks he comes back with a lot of money. He comes back with some uh, new dresses or new wrappers for uh, for his grandmother and her sister. Um, he comes back actually with a shroud for himself, which uh, he uh, he doesn't initially tell Patu that it's his shroud. He tells her just to hold on to it until he says the time is right. Um, but we we do find out that it's his shroud. But we learn that he was not actually away working. Uh, he was away at a training camp learning to be an Islamic suicide bomber. Um, and essentially what happens is that Musa and his friend Ali are supposed to blow themselves up in a church uh, during a, the wedding, actually, of his, some of his relatives, of Musa's relatives. Musa is unable to go through with it, but Ali does blow himself up, killing everyone in the church. Musa 
had fled the church and he was actually seen and recognized leaving the scene of that explosion and so he gets arrested and he's visited in prison by um the guy who was his um Quranic school teacher, sorry, um, by Sheikh Sas Sani. Um, and Sani and Musa have an interesting debate about whether or not there is any justification for the suicide bombing and whether or not Musa's plan was an effective way to achieve his goals because essentially what musa says is that uh the reason they've turned to terrorist activity the reason they've turned to suicide bombing is because the muslims in nigeria he's speaking on behalf of a large number of them but it's not necessarily clear like in real life it's not necessarily clear that the majority of muslims in nigeria or anywhere else uh would support Musa's violence. The, all of the evidence really suggests that the overwhelming majority of Muslims reject uh, religious terrorism. Uh, but Musa's, Musa believes that he is sort of acting on behalf of the community of Muslims in Nigeria, whom he believes have been essentially cut out of political discourse, and that Christians in Nigeria have uh, become repressive of Muslims, of their Muslim neighbors, and um, essentially, like, disenfranchised them. He also accuses, essentially accuses Sani of selling out the Islamic community uh, because Sani says, actually, remember, <laughs> there are Muslim leaders who are part of the Nigerian government, who are part of these sort of, like, discussions about religious freedom and coexistence and things like this in Nigeria. And Musa essentially says, yeah, but the people who are involved in those talks don't actually speak on our behalf. They don't actually speak on behalf of the real Muslims. Um, and, and so this is, I think, a really interesting line of reasoning because what and 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 Sonny, of course, is very uh, concerned that, and there's practical reasons for this because he doesn't want to be labeled as someone who who trains terrorists. Um, and again, Musa was his student. Um, but Sonny is very concerned about the way that this um, suicide bombing is going to be perceived as being. And I mean, we saw this continually. Uh, throughout the war on terror, the ongoing war on terror, one might add, um, where any attack by Muslims gets spun as Islam is a big religion of violence and all this nonsense. Um, so Sonny is very concerned about that. And he's... He, he does seem to be a believer in peace. Um, and one of the things that Musa essentially says is, yeah, I turned away from your approach. And so in that last third or so of the play, Musa kind of, I mean, because um, Patu and Amina also come and they're basically like, why have you like betrayed us in this way? Why have you turned to violence when... Like, you know that it's the wrong thing to do. And it's, so essentially, Musa spends the last third or so of the play basically being like, even though there were all of these forces that wanted me to be peaceful and wanted me to be a tolerant, sort of supportive member of, of a society with large Muslim and Christian populations, I chose not to. 
because I feel that this is the right thing for me to do. So that idea of choice is posited as the sort of alternative to the questions of, of uh, fatalism raised in the first half or so of the play. But it's very interesting here because Musa also is a devout Muslim. And so he doesn't actually believe in choice in in that sense. Like that devout Muslims, devout Christians, devout Jews believe there is a divine plan that Allah or God or whatever it is, Yahweh, whatever it is, has predestined things. And so there's still that interesting tension between fate and free will and Yurima doesn't attempt to resolve it for us but he shows us these dynamic ways in which society is sort of pulled in different directions by these ideas of fate free will etc etc and the the sort of tragic component of them